You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 185. I want to top expectations. I want to blow you away. Quentin Tarantino. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft. It's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. Today's show is also sponsored by Indie Film Hustle Pro, our private and growing community for filmmakers and screenwriters. It was created for film creatives like you to meet, network, and support each other, learn from film industry experts, and to get the answers to your burning questions and more. The journey in this business is rough. There is no guarantee to success, but your chances of reaching your goals dramatically improve when you find others who are on the same journey as you and you work together towards a common goal. That is why I put together IFH Pro. Inside, you'll get professional networking, private and safe spaces to discuss the film business, access to advanced tools and education, up-to-date education, exclusive content not available publicly, access to IFH Pro workshops, webinars, special guests, and so, so much more. If you want to check it out, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash pro. Well, guys, today on the show, we have Kristen Verlinden. And she is the writer-director of the new film, Alice. And Kristen has a very unique story on how she was, she came up, how she was able to get this project off the ground, the trouble she had in, with COVID on the set, and how she got Quentin Tarantino to mentor her as a writer-director, where she was in the room with Quentin while he was writing Inglorious Bastards and many other projects that he has put out. So this was a fascinating conversation with a fellow cinephile, and I cannot wait for you guys to hear it. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Kristen Verlinden. I'd like to welcome the show, Kristen Verlinden. How are you doing, Kristen? I'm doing pretty good. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I am excited to talk about your new film, Alice. I get pitched all the time for people to come on the show. And when I saw your trailer, I was like, oh my God, yes, I have to have her on the show. I have to, I, I need to see this film. And then I need to ha- I need to find, I need to go inside the mind that came up with this film <laughs> and see how the hell it got made. So first question, my dear, is how did you get into the film and why did you want to get into the film business? This insanity <laughs> that is the film industry. I, um, it's all I've ever wanted to do since I was a little kid. So from the time I was about seven, I remember seeing Lawrence of Arabia and I got it. I didn't get obsessed with Peter O'Toole or the actors. I got obsessed with David Lane. And so my parents thought I was really weird, but I was obsessed with David Lane films. So I wanted to see Dr. Zhivago, everything he made. And it took me down that path, ultimately. He was like a rock star. So then I got into Akira Kurosawa and our Andre Tarkovsky and Sam Peckinpah, which, thank God, my parents let me watch. Wow. And um, How old were you when you were watching Peckinpah? Uh, well, this was later down, so I was probably like 11 or 12. That's still, still young. way too young to be watching Peckinpah. <laughs> way too young. Your parents are horrible, but yes, good. Good for your artistic, <laughs> your artistic <laughs> development. <laughs> But I realized all of my heroes were screenwriters. Yes. And that's how they became filmmakers, directors. So 
in a, you know, in a neurotic panic in sixth grade, an existential crisis, I switched my trajectory to screenwriting because I knew that would be the, the, the path into becoming a director. And thank God it worked out. <laughs> And it's been smooth sailing the entire time, obviously. I mean, you just wrote your first script. You just you just got you know, millions of oh, dollars yeah. have been – I mean, money just falls in. You could do whatever you want. Now, generally, that's just been smooth sailing, correct? So easy. You know, it, it didn't take it 11 years at all. <laughs> You're an 11-year overnight success. So, exactly. so how did you get – like, what were the first kind of gigs? How did you – I mean, because I'm assuming you've been writing – a lot since you you know you began, um, yeah. but how many scripts did you write before something was purchased or um, optioned? Oh man! Well, it was kind of a weird trajectory because I started working with Quentin Tarantino, mm -hmm. and he became my never, mentor. Never heard of him. Never heard. I have no idea <laughs> yeah, who you're talking about. Really nice, you know, little crazy guy, but <laughs> he's trying to make it too. Yeah, he's hustling it out there as well. Yeah, <laughs> but he. Um, I learned everything from him. And ironically, he was never my hero growing up. He was just, I looked at him as, oh, we have the same heroes in common. So we speak the same language. Right. Um, but yeah, I learned, you know, how to conduct myself as a director on a set, how you uh, create a safe space for actors. And he just, as a, as a screenwriter as well, he, he helped me with, you know, don't, write a screenplay and look at it as this is the this is the means to support myself look at it as i have a voice what is the story i want to tell without thinking of the outcome and that was the big difference from when i was writing as a teenager versus when i started working with him and um yeah i mean i don't know how many scripts i had written because i, I was writing scripts for for since I was a kid. So, I mean, yeah, there were tons and tons. Um, but this, the first script that sold was about Arthur Ashe. Mm -hmm. And I know it sold because that was when I finally listened to him and I wasn't thinking of <laughs> the commercial aspect. And yes. I was writing my heart. And so right. it showed. Yeah, because our, Arthur Ashe's bio is going to get at least three, four hundred million dollar budget. Easy, comfortably, <laughs> comfortably. Huge, huge, very general market film. Um, no, but so I have to ask you, though, how did you hook up with Quentin? How did that? Because every filmmaker, every young screenwriter in Hollywood would love to be mentored by Quentin Tarantino. So how did you guys meet and how did you how and what did you do for him as far as working with him? Yeah, so I met him, I started, when I moved to LA, I started throwing, like, underground movie nights. Um, my uncle was a big uh, boxer in the 70s, mm -hmm. and so he broke Muhammad Ali's jaw and took the title, so he, and and then he got into black exploitation movies. This is all before I was born. So every summer, who, I was- Who was your, who was your, uh, fa was it father or uncle? Uncle. Yeah. Ken Norton. His oh shoot! Kim. Yes, I know. Of course, I know who. Because I'm like, wait a minute. I just saw the Muhammad Ali documentary. So I remember someone breaking his jaw. <laughs> oh wow! Okay, that's very cool. Yeah, and so um, when I graduated, I moved down to his house. It was kind of in the back of my head of like, yeah, that'll be that'll that's free rent. Um, so I I started throwing um, movie nights in his house, and they became like a little underground thing. And it was Edgar Wright who I met, who actually was throwing a movie night at his friend's house and his friend was Quentin. So that's how we met. And it was like two Highlanders meeting, uh, <laughs> you know, because, because Edgar said, oh, she's a, she's a, a cinephile. She loves movies, which is all it takes to start a battle. <laughs> and then oh, he really? Arguing about gun smoke and, and <laughs> random things <laughs> at 10 o'clock at night. But, um, so yeah, ultimately that's how I met him. And uh, the first thing we did together was uh, my job was to write out because he writes freehand. So my job was to type out everything that he wrote. So I knew my job was expendable. So I ultimately had to create uh, value <laughs> in myself. And, you know, so it, it was almost like working for Winston Churchill where someone would pace the room and you, you know, he's taught you're, you're, you're talking out a scene and he's 
talking to himself or you don't know if he's talking to himself and then you know he's he's uh questioning you know oh i wonder if he should do that and then you find yourself interjecting and saying well you know maybe you don't need all the reins on a reservation for 40 minutes (laughs) (laughs) just as as a thing so what were some if you don't mind me asking what was the first project so you were out there you're out there typing as he's writing or translating his 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 scripts yeah, so Onto, they would be written by hand and you type them out. Right, so I have to ask, what was the first movie that you worked with them on? Unglorious Bastards. So when you're reading Unglorious, so when you're typing in Unglorious Bastards for the first, like you're one of the first people in the world to see Inglorious Bastards as it's coming out. Mm-hmm. What the hell is that like? Daunting. Uh, yeah. Intimidating, but it also, when you're 18, it's a... Uh, it kind of throws you right into a, to a, the, the, it throws you right into the mix of everything that would intimidate you later on when you like made it. <laughs> so yes. If you made it. So yeah, when it got to the point where I was on my own set making a movie, nothing about directing was hard or daunting. It was the COVID aspect that was hard and daunting so it was almost like god said yeah i'll i'll finally give you what you want but i'm gonna make it a little a a little bit harder because (laughs) you've got this other stuff so you were on the set and you basically kind of shadowed quentin a lot of times or not yeah yeah Yeah. so i learned how to make movies from him i mean ultimately when you love film and you study you learn from everybody but that was like my film school it's not i mean listen it's not a bad film school if you can get it i'm just i'm just throwing that out there i mean it's not a bad film school what is the best advice you got from him uh on as a director as a director and as a writer don't be the filmmaker that sits in a tent 10 feet away staring at a monitor that's not filmmaking that's not directing and that's not leadership so his whole his whole um method and his it, one of the pieces of advice for me was uh your cam your camera operator is your best friend so wherever he is you should be right there and so your actors can see you because if they know you're right there with them they'll give you everything they have yeah they'll you know? perform they'll perform almost for you as a- yes exactly when they know their directors right just within a arm's length they'll they will give you everything you have because they feel like man i can see them i can see their reactions they're if it's cold they're cold with me we're weathering the storm together it's a totally different experience and then how about for writing Ooh, um probably what i said earlier where don't write something as a means to an end write it because you have a story to tell what is things and what is your process to writing uh is it uh, you know, what, like when you sit down to write a story like Alice, how did you start this conversation? How did you begin? Do you wake up every morning and wait for the muse to show up? You just show up to the same place and you hope that <laughs> she or he shows up and gives you a little, little magic. How, what is your process? Well, when I was writing Alice, I was like in a flow state that summer. I remember there was like tons of eclipses. So it was like weird energy. And, and anyway, but, um, no, I was in the middle of finishing a script. And my mom had sent me a bunch of articles and she always does like, you know, with any parent, they're trying to any parent with a kid that's remotely creative. They try to inject their little ideas into your life. Of course. So she um, she sent me these articles and they basically were 10 or 12 different articles about different people coming out in the 60s that were enslaved and didn't know slavery had ended in the deep South. And so the more I dug into it, the more I was like, Oh my God, this is, it wasn't even a, there was never a moment where I said, I have to write this in that sense. It was more like, I remember reading the articles and within 48 hours, I just opened final draft and I was like, what would that even feel like? It was more me trying to get a feeling of what that would be like in the best way I could. So I just started writing. I remember I just wrote the first scene. And then from there, within seven days, it was like, it felt like I was channeling. 
within seven days I had written the first draft. I always, I always love asking writers that because I feel that, uh, that I, I, as I write, sometimes I look at the page, I'm like, who wrote that? Like how, yeah. how did that, I don't, whoever wrote this is fantastic. This is great. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> or sometimes it's like, this is dog crap. I obviously wrote this part. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I heard the best analogy for the creative process for writers ever. Um, when I spoke to uh, the writer of, um, Turning Red, the Pixar writer, Julia Chow. Mm -hmm. She said, it's like a surfer. Every day you go out and you try to catch the waves. The waves come and you have no control over the waves, but you need to have your craft to a place yeah. where you can catch a big wave when it comes. Because if you're a newbie, you'll get that that wave is just too much for it's you daunting and then you question i shouldn't be doing this or right this. but but you have to show up every day and some days the waves are good some days yep. the waves are horrible but you have to keep showing up I'm like wow i'm like that is amazing because it is just waves of inspiration waves of that thing that we tap into yep. as writers um and i always and, believe go ahead, go ahead and trust you know that was a big thing i've learned now is trusting the process whereas Five years ago, I would have panicked and said, oh, the, you know, this is the universe saying that I shouldn't be writing this. So you just stop, <laughs> you know, now. And even, you know, Nikola Tesla, this is random. You know, he said creativity comes best at night energetically. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So I actually, with the script I'm writing now, I've never been a night writer, but I've, I've been trying it. And it actually, there is something to that. Interesting. It, I'm easy. It's an easier channel it's an easier channel if you will yeah, yeah it's like the forces have calmed down for the day so. i i love working i like working early morning so like it's still night yeah. so yeah it's like on the yeah i'm got I'm, I'm getting the the, the down the downward spiral i'm not at the top of the hill but i'm getting the downwards but yeah when everything's quiet and there's nobody to bother mm -hmm. you there's no phone calls there's no emails exactly. that is it's a fantastic so so you came up with alice which is a fantastic can you tell the audience what alice is about so in in a short sentence or two just so people understand the genius <laughs> yeah should i get well yeah i'll give yeah give it so, give a description yeah alice is about a woman on a plantation who runs away only to find out that it's 1973 so she's a slave on a plantation very important part slave, yes <laughs> yeah, she's not the owner she's a slave <laughs> that's a, totally different movie. That's a yes, whole other alice movie is born into slavery she only, that's the only world experience she's had, her only world. And we get hints and glimpses that there might be something else out there. And when she does finally make her escape, we realize that this family had been keeping up a tradition for 10 years after slavery was abolished. And the first person she meets is Common, which is... I would get in a I would get in a car with Common, and that's what I asked myself when I was casting. Who would I, if I were Alice, running into a world I didn't know? Who would I get into a car with? I would feel safe getting into a car with Common. You know what? Oddly enough, I know he's played some badasses in his day, but he <laughs> has that face. He has a really kind of There's calm, something paternal about him. It's very calm. He has a very calm energy, if you will. Yeah, he's been in John Wick, and yeah, he's been a badass, no question. But yeah. when you see when you see his face, you don't. You, it's it's. Yeah, I agree with you, hundred percent. It was great casting, great, great casting. Yeah, and because there's also this uh, thin line between we don't want the audience for we don't want the audience to want these two to get together. Right. <laughs> you know, I was I was finding that myself. I was kind of like while I was watching the film, I'm like. Are they going to get together? But she's got a guy back at the plantation who got, you know, so I'm like, is he like, so, but there was never an instant that there was a look or yeah. there, was, there, or there was a thing that you're like, oh, there was never a hint of it. And it was just very almost transactional, but with love, if that makes any yeah. sense, like a brother, yeah. sister, like a brother, sister love that it's, it, it wasn't. It was just great. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed that. Now I have to ask. Okay, so this script gets written. Uh, what's the process when you when you when you send it out? Um, who? How did you get the financing for it? How did you get this film off the ground? I mean, it's not the easiest sell 
on paper. I mean, no. it's not, this is not, there's no soup, there's no capes. Now, if you would have had, if, if Alice would have had a cape, 100 million. But. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, attaching myself as a director. First time, It yeah. wasn't like I had a short film to say, yeah, look, I, look, I, you know, I have vision, I have an eye. All I had was the writing. Mm. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, so, yeah, so I'd written, I'd written probably five or six scripts that had sold at that point. And I was at the stage um, in my heart where I felt like, okay, it's time to make the transition into what I really want to do. Right. Writing is beautiful. I love it. It feels so, it feels like flying, but I'm only using a percentage of what I'm capable of. And so, um, yeah, uh, you know, you write multiple scripts and you feel like a surrogate mother, you're carrying this child and then you're handing it off to someone else. So when I wrote Alice, it was a story that felt, um, every story feels cathartic, but this one felt different in the sense that I knew I could shoot it for a certain budget. You know, so I wasn't attaching myself to some big screenplay I wrote saying, yeah, you know, I'm capable of doing this. Um, I knew it was something I could could do that was doable and practical, but it was also something that felt um, very, very personal just because I grew up in a small town and didn't feel like I had a voice that was primarily white. Mm. And my mom's black, my dad's white. So you kind of feel like the odd person, you know, stuck in this little world and, you know, you have no voice, you feel just completely trapped only to leave. So there was something, something very personal about it. And I just fell in love with Alice. And um, so I attached myself as a director and my agents went out with it with the intention of if no one wants to do this with me as a director and they just want to option it as me as a writer, I will just put it on the shelf. You know, I'm not going to, I'm just, I'm done doing that. So it was kind of like my intention to the universe is like, it's either now or, you know, well, maybe not never. But. You pulled the shot. You pulled the Shawshank. You pulled the Shawshank. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. you, you pulled the Shawshank. Exactly. And um, yeah, so I met, uh, Coincidentally, I was having lunch with Greg Silverman. Mm -hmm. He used to run Warner Brothers and I had made a deck for Alice and I, you know, it wasn't out to him as a producer. I was just casually and I think that's why it worked, because I was just casually talking about passionately talking about, yeah, there's this thing I want to direct. And I was showing him the deck and he he said, no, I want to help you get this off of the ground. I want to help you make this. And so it was Greg's with Greg's help brought me to Steel Springs with Peter, who was the financier and producer. And it happened really, really fast. Like within probably three or four days, we were talking about casting and had casting agents. And then um, we cast Johnny Lee Miller first. Oh, I stood in New so York and cast Kiki. And then um, I met common here in town and we hit it off and we cast him and i was like wow this is see this is when everything's when everything aligns Suppose. it's meant to be and then covid hits and then the world shuts down so when was this being shot when did you start shooting the uh, original? um no so so casting happened at the end like during um november december january february of what of what year March, of what year? 2020? Of 2019. And then oh. 20, so February of 2020, we were already like, okay, you know, the line producer, we had scouts out, oh. we gearing up to go. And then, yeah, everything shut down. I remember watching the basketball game where <laughs> they stopped playing and I was just like, yeah. It's a, so that I mean that feeling must be I can't even imagine I, I mean I can't imagine because I've had I've gone through that not exactly like yours but when you your whole life has been aiming to one direction and you get there <laughs> and then really unheard of the world shuts down 
Yep. It's because it's not about you. The movie didn't fall apart. <laughs> the funding didn't go away. The actor didn't leave. The world shut down. And yeah. you're just like, really? <laughs> I mean, that's what it was. I was like, you know, and then I get, I'm, I'm super spiritual. So I, I went to the place where it was like, well, I attracted this. Like, this is my perception <laughs> yeah, of, this is my version of the world. <laughs> In other parallel universes, the world hasn't shut down. So you're fairly powerful as a spiritual being. If you alone brought COVID, <laughs> if you think that you brought COVID to stop you, <laughs> this is the no. insanity of filmmaking. This is the insanity of being a filmmaker. Exactly. It's no, amazing. Kidding. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I took solace in that. Of course. Sure. Of course. Of course. But um, miraculously, we still plugged along. Like the producer was like, no, we're going to Georgia on this date. And we did. So in June, we went down there to prep. We prepped for a month. We were one week out from shooting when um, one of our assistants tested positive. And then it ended up being a false positive. But it was enough. There was, a, there was so much insanity oh, I remember. 2020 that we were like, okay, for everyone's safety, we have to be rational. So we shut down. We, we came back in September. And... Uh, in September, we were like, okay, we'll just run and gun almost guerrilla style, truly, like literally wrapping a scene and getting on go-karts and rushing <laughs> to the next, you know, to the next spot to shoot um, or setting up. I remember setting up one scene and getting it going and leaving to direct another actor in another scene. So it was like, we were really just in a hurry to get this movie made. So it's 22 days of just the quickest, longest days of my life. <laughs> but it was good because on the next movie to have a, more days and more time will feel like oh. some sort of gift. You'd be like, what? 180 days? <laughs> what am I, John Woo? Like, how is... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh my exactly. God. How is that... Or even, or even 40 days will be like, whoa, we if you double six oh. hours a day, that's amazing. The one thing you'll never hear as a director, all you have is time and money. That's the one <laughs> sentence that will never come out of no. anybody's mouth. <laughs> true so as a, so as a first time director you walk on the set now you've been on multiple sets and obviously you've been on some fairly big sets with quentin mm -hmm. uh and and you know seeing how he dealt with big movie stars and mm -hmm. and, and his work so i don't feel that and, and correct me if i'm wrong i don't feel that you were intimidated walking onto a set yourself but i i have to believe that there had to be some sort of butterflies as a yeah. First time director coming yeah. on with this crew. I know when I was a first time director and when I was a young director, you know, you were afraid of the old 65 year old grip or gaffer <laughs> who who's looking at you and like, who the hell is this PA? No, I'm the director. Oh, and that whole act. So I'm imagining, and that's from coming from a male perspective. So I can only imagine yeah. coming from a female director's perspective. What was that like? Well, you know, it's interesting it, it, two things. I it wasn't that because every morning I would make a speech. So they knew. You, so they knew you weren't the PA. So they all knew I was the director. <laughs> and even though I had a mask, and we all had masks, so I really never met the crew other than their eyes. <laughs> so that was the kind of the best thing. So there was no chance they just had to do their job, and they didn't have time yeah, to save the see your faces. So I'm sure in a different world with more exposure but there was like some weird safety and to see eyes. but um i would make my speech but the first day there was butterflies but the butterflies were coming from oh my god i want to be excited but what if we get shut down those two people are standing really close together there's like a, a paranoia with covid but there's also the aspect even though i'd been on other sets i'd never been around a method actor ever before uh -huh. and John is a method actor and so before before COVID well okay before we started shooting Johnny and I became really good friends like you want to build chemistry with your actors so I was sending him Ken Burns documentaries on the Civil War like to get him into like this you know the south you know the south shall rise again energy and and send, you know, Night of the Hunter, sure. you know, is a movie where, you know, it's calm and subdued or whatever. 
And so he, I was like, man, he's so cool. And we can talk about anything. We have great chemistry and he's going to be a great actor. And he is. Oh, he's amazing. But he told me, he said, you know, once I get to Georgia, I'm going to be Paul. And I said, yeah, yeah. 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 And then he showed up. He wasn't joking. Like Johnny didn't exist. There was this guy with a Southern accent who, who didn't know me, but was ready to work. And so it was the, the, wow. It happened on my first movie, having that experience because method acting is a whole different beast that I had never encountered in my life, even as a witness. So it was, it was interesting. And every day, you know, Kiki and, and, uh, common, common and Johnny's days only overlapped once, right. but, uh, it was just interesting to have Paul on set and never Johnny. <laughs> so, which is which is fascinating because he is a obviously Paul is you know racist and you know he's a slave yeah. owner and <laughs> all of these things being directed by a woman of color. Yep. How did that? I just have to ask, like, how did like how did he it, take <laughs> direction from a woman of color if he's method? It was- it was insane. Like he, you know, you would, you would crouch down and whisper something in his ear and he's kind of like, yeah, okay. Yeah. I know. I mean, like he just, it was just a surreal experience. Wow. It was one of those things where, you know, you feel like Albert Brooks was writing your life. <laughs> <laughs> where it's like, that's the only person that would have come up with this situation so, right that's actually i've never heard i mean i look i've heard of a lot of stories in hollywood i've never heard of, of th- that <laughs> this specific scenario is so i mean i heard daniel day obviously his method yeah. and all that but he <laughs> he played lincoln the opposite of uh of paul but i will say this and i maybe it's because it was like the last few hours of shooting and before he had to go home johnny I will say Paul disappeared when Common showed up because Johnny wanted to meet Common. <laughs> so, there were exceptions to the rule where he broke character and he's like, hey man, I love your, you know. So I was like, oh, okay. So, so if Johnny I'm common, said, if I'm common, you will you'll yeah, break character. And I guess, you know, Paul can back up so Johnny can meet him. That is that is fascinating. I've never dealt with a, a method actor in all of my career. I've been it's directing very interesting. It is uh, I've heard stories. Um yeah. and you know, like Jim Carrey on on the set of Man in the Moon, who literally yeah. was channeling Andy Kaufman <laughs> for God's sakes on that film. They made a documentary about how crazy he was. On set. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's insane. Um now I have to ask you, you know, you have some very difficult scenes in the movie mm-hmm. um, that are sensitive for both actors uh, for, for Paul and for Kiki uh, and for Alice. How do you direct scenes that are so difficult emotionally? Because I mean, I obviously I think for Johnny, it might've, I think it might've been a protective thing for him to be Paul because mm-hmm. he wouldn't have to, because Johnny didn't have a say in what was going on. But if he stayed as Paul, it'd be easier to do the job it, yes. it, in my head. That's, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Cause and he's Johnny's so sweet. Right. So, so like jo- Johnny probably couldn't do that, but yeah. Paul could. Yes. And how did you direct those scenes with Kiki and him and, and, and just the brutality of some of those scenes? Well, Luckily, because we had so much time because of COVID, so we were constantly having a a dialogue about how to handle these scenes and how to feel and what it's um, what it means if we get the right performance across. And so it was just taken very um, lovingly in every way. So. Uh, before we um, shot those scenes, we actually rehearsed them so we could, you know, kind of get, you know, and not full blown performances, but kind of get into. Dip, dip your toe in. Yeah, dip your toe in and, and to kind of absorb and go home that night and think about it and feel it. And for Kiki, I know it was very, very, very um, emotionally taxing and so you know even the scene where she's tied up and has the scolds bridle on i was sitting literally sitting right next to her and we were both crying and i uh 
in between takes I was playing music for her and like sitting on the ground with her and you just have to take it like that like we're two sisters and we're going through this experience together so that's I mean that's got to be that's that's why I have so much respect for actors because I mean to, mm-hmm. to put yourself emotionally through that again and again I'm assuming you didn't do 80 takes of those scenes so you weren't you weren't that director you didn't Kubrick and it you out know, the, weird, the weirdest part was it was also during the presidential uh, election so in Georgia there were <laughs> huge crowds of MAGA supporters sure so we would drive to work on to go to a plantation and even specifically that day i remember how many protesters were out so there was an extra layer of emotion of like the frustration of what our country how divided our country is so it was just it was interesting the layers that we had to navigate my god and just the uh, the uh, irony Mm-hmm. Of what you, the irony of like I'm going to a slave plantation to shoot a movie about free base basically someone's free, you know releasing them in freedom while passing yeah. through a manga yeah <laughs> and seeing the separation between it's like oh my god this is have we not grown since the Civil War yeah like, yeah exactly it's my god, god that you have so many layers to the production of this film like it, there's yeah. so many onion layers like Shrek many layers to the onion. <laughs> If you think, like if I if I may if I may quote the philosopher Donkey, uh, <laughs> there's so many layers. There's so many layers to uh, to this. And I mean, again, I just I loved I loved uh, John. By the way, Johnny, so good. Mm-hmm. I mean, such a bastard in this movie. <laughs> He's yeah. so fantastically wonderful. When you said he was method, yeah. I'm like, okay, that makes all the sense in the world. By the way, the music fantastic the score the music in the background it was so beautifully like i'm like oh i can jam to this whole album like it's just like such a beautiful way of doing it and you know rashid did the score rashid really common really he did the whole score yeah Yeah, so i so when i'm when i was writing the script i did the needle drops the, the songs i was writing to um that's another quentin thing but yeah i imagine with the score, he had said when we first met, he was like, you know, if you don't, if you are open to it later on, you don't have to think, think, of, think on it now, but no pressure. I would like to do the score or try, you know, you mean, the, you what, so that you mean the Oscar, the Oscar winning, the Oscar <laughs> yeah. winner. Yeah, sure. Sure. Got it. Yeah. And so, um, <laughs> yeah, once we got to Georgia, I was sending him music and ideas and he was sending me music. Which is surreal because as a little kid, Common was my hero. Oh my! So I'm like, this is so cool. And it was nervous because I at first I was like, "Is it okay to send them like this idea?" Because I'm not, com- you know, I'm not in the music business. But um, he was amazing, and he went above and beyond with scoring this movie and, and capturing the energy. And like, I remember one day when we got back to LA and they were scoring, he called me and he's like, "Hey, Chris." Uh, Shaka's in the studio and I want her to do a song for us. What do you think? And it's like, what do you, what, what? No, no, absolutely, no. absolutely not. Yeah, no, no, I never, I, Shaka Khan, no way. Never. Right, so he was pulling off stuff that with our budget, we could have never done. So Common's an angel. Wow, that's that's remarkable. <laughs> like, no, 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 Shaka Khan. Can you get a K-pop though? Can you get a K-pop yeah. band? But not Shaka. Shaka, what? No. <laughs> that's re- that's that's rem- no. It was so beautifully done. I I just felt when I listened to when I listened to scores for mu- for for movies, a lot of times it's kind of you could just see that they were kind of like kind of like just thrown in, but mm-hmm. this was so weaved in to the narrative. It just fits so beautifully. And I didn't know common did it. And of course the, the needle drops are all beautiful. I'm like, Oh, I love that song. I love that song. I love that song. That song, that song. <laughs> but the references and when she's, you know, when she's watching, um, was it coffee? Yeah. Coffee and watching <laughs> Pam Greer and just like, Oh man, that's some good stuff right there, man. That's just, <laughs> she looks, fan- she looked fantastic. The, oh, the, the production the costume design. Oh yeah. So yeah. good, so so good. Now on on the on. And so she, you, the costume designer, did do Shawshank. Since you brought, she that did. Up. She did Shawshank. Yeah, she's a super talented woman. I love her. 
Well, Shawshank's one of my favorite. I, I mean, I always tell people like, if, "What's your like Shawshank's probably as close to perfection?" Yeah, as a writing sample, as a directing sample, yeah. it's just yeah. And the audience, my audience, understands my love for for, for Shawshank. So I won't go deep into the, into the weeds on it, but <laughs> it's just one of those films. Um, now, as a director, we all go through a day on set where the entire world is coming crashing down around us. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Mm-hmm. You're losing the sun, the camera doesn't work. The method <laughs> actor is having an issue. Uh, <laughs> something is happening and you're like, oh my God, why am I here? Um, how can, what was that day for you? If it wasn't every day, uh, what was that day for you? <laughs> Say that was the whole shoot. <laughs> but what, was there a moment in that shoot where you just, besides COVID, um, yeah, is, that something happened? You're like, how am I going to get through this? And how did you get through it? Uh, yeah. Well, there were t- the even the the first uh, the first scene in the movie. I remember the camera operator was like, the 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 dolly isn't working for the opening shot. <laughs> <laughs> And I was just, we kind of sat there and the producer's like, we have no time, keep going, just figure it out. So you're sitting there. And so I, you come up with a new way of opening the movie. Um, so that was one experience. I mean, there were so many days like that. Um, probably the most daunting was when I had to be in two places at once. Mm-hmm. And this is probably like on the fourth day. So you're still kind of getting into the rhythm and you're, you're feeling sorry for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like why am I here? I did yeah, not such like a... I why I maybe I don't want to do this. Maybe this isn't my life path. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Every director, every director at one point or another had that conversation in their head. Every yeah. director, because it's just you sit there going, "It's tough, man. This is tough work." I mean, directing yeah. the stress, the pressure, the amount of mental strain, the amount the of physical, the physical. People don't think yeah. about the physical. You got to get into shape. Exhausting. <laughs> Big on your feet all yeah. day. Have good shoes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But um, yeah, it was being two places at once and having to set up a scene and get it going with a kid, a child actor, yeah. and then running across to set up another scene. That was a complicated shot. And then having to run, literally running back and forth and things just weren't... Um, Cooking, yeah. Cooking, like uh, just the the camera, like the just on a technical level, things were were there were some issues, and so it was it was stressful, and it was like, oh my god, are we gonna even make this day? And if we don't make this, we don't have it in the budget to keep yeah. for an extra day. So you're it, there. It was just one of those like worries. stress, stress, yeah. on top of stress, on top of stress. Yeah, directors don't age well. I'm just saying, directors don't. <laughs> You'll be fine. Good. Who? The women. Sofia Coppola has kept her face. The, the, yes, she has. She has. There's no question. <laughs> they, look, yes. But generally speaking, there's a couple more gray hairs are going to pop out. <laughs> I, agree. I agree. I agree. <laughs> Another. But you know what? They also didn't tell me the forces that be uh, when I was shot listing. So during prep, my DP and I would actually go on location to every scene and shot list in real time. Mm-hmm. And I remember one day we were shot listing and I had like this elaborate thing I wanted to do. And I was like, you know, Stanley Kubrick used this, but it really wasn't his. And it was, I was going into a thing that he didn't care about. And he was like, you know, that this isn't the script we're going to shoot. Right. And he said it in the sweetest way. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, no, there, there's gonna, there's always that moment before the movie where we have to, you know, you're going to go over the budget and see what we need to keep and what goes. And I was like, that's not going to, what are you talking about? <laughs> and yeah. Long behold, you know, you have that, the production meeting where he, the DP and the producer and the line producer and everyone sits down and you realize, okay, you have to cut. I remember when that happened, they're like, okay, you have to lose 20 pages. Oh. If we're going to make, because the COVID budget. Sure. You know, doctor on the set oh yeah like, it ate into you yeah testing was expensive so that was probably the hardest even though that's not shooting but to answer your question the hardest thing was losing 20 pages 
And then you have to go through your baby and then just start. And how do you make it and, and have it still make sense for you? Sense for me. Oh yeah. my God. Do you, so did you, cute. did you ever suffer with a little bit of imposter syndrome? Um, ever in your life <laughs> as a writer, as a director, every day in my life. <laughs> I was about to say, I, I ask that question all the time because it is something so rampant in, uh, as, as a creative, we all go through yeah. it. And I've had the pleasure of speaking I mean, to even some... talking to you yeah. I, this morning, I was like, what, are, you know, yes. what? Why, why, why talking to me? Why me? Yeah, exactly. I'm like, who am I? Like, <laughs> that's amazing. That's ridiculous. No, I appreciate that. But, you know, you, I've, talk, I've had the pleasure of, of, you know, interviewing some really amazing people, people on the show. And the common thread is imposter syndrome. I'm like, you won an Oscar. Yeah, but I still don't know. You know, like, yeah. what? You won two yeah. Oscars. I bet. You know, I'm still hustling. I'm like, how is that? So I, I always like to bring that up for filmmakers and screenwriters listening to understand yeah. that if you do, if you have imposter syndrome, it's everyone, insane. everyone has it. Everyone has. I it. remember when Quentin went out with Django, like went out to to the studios. I remember he <laughs> at one point when we met up for lunch, he was like, can you believe like they actually liked it? I was like, do you not know who you are? Like in my head, it's like, do you not know who you are? Of course they're going to like it. Like what's your, what? Like, but he still is amazed when like people react to his, his screenplays. And, stuff. and I think the moment he doesn't, that's when the problems will begin. Yeah. I think, I think he, he, ha there has to be that level of, that that level there has to be something there because at the end of the day yeah you've done 10 amazing things but 11 could yeah. suck it hasn't worked i mean <laughs> look you know hey there's very few directors who have a, a bat a thousand that's true there's very few directors who bat a thousand quentin i'd argue is is close to a thousand with all of his films yeah. he's you know i think james cameron is probably another one that you just like well yeah I mean, you know, but, but some of the greats, you know, even someone like the, the, the rock star, David Lean and Pac mm -hmm. and Paul and Kubrick. Oh, Peck and Paul, yeah. I mean, I think Kubrick bad a thousand, but that's just me. But I agree. Yeah, I mean, generally. Oh, wait, no. His very first movie. That doesn't count. He doesn't consider that part of his canon. Let's geek out for a but second. that's such an easy excuse. Fear and Desire is not a real Kubrick film. It's not like he's like. <laughs> That was an experiment. It was like my student film. That's he, such an easy thing. Yeah. But, so if it doesn't work, if it's not a good movie, you can say, well, that was, you know, that wasn't really <laughs> my first Fair movie. enough. So fair enough. So then he's <laughs> batting 950. All right. So he's yeah. batting, he's batting 950. But uh, <laughs> yeah, if it doesn't work, that wasn't, I never meant to do that. Uh, <laughs> It was just practice, but yeah, but and that and that's the other thing too is so you know when you start meeting and speaking to these people you you grew up looking at and 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 you know they are they are movie gods, but they're mm -hmm. human. They're just human beings, and they're artists trying to figure it out just like you are, and and that's the thing I've come to learn from speaking to so many of these amazing filmmakers and screenwriters that you just like they're. Just, they're just trying to figure it out. Yeah, they're they've got different levels of problems that you and I don't have. Like Quinn problems are not Kristen and Alex problems. Okay, no. that's <laughs> that's no. like I can't have Will Smith in my movie. That is a Quinn problem, not a Kristen yeah. and Alex problem. Yeah, yeah. Who do I pick, Brad or Leo? I just oh, know. let's just put them both in. Yeah, let's, let's, let's find a way to work with both of them. And budget to pay both of them <laughs> yeah generally when brad and leo want to be in the movie they, the, the money find, comes somehow magically money yes. money shows up somehow with that now you also premiered this film at sundance which was mm -hmm. um i gotta ask i always love asking sundance filmmakers what was it like getting the call oh my god it was it was uh, one of the most memorable days of my life because i was my mom was in town um I was, I was having that imposter syndrome or, you know, the mental crisis of what is this going to be? What's going to happen? You know, what's going to happen? All of the human worries that, you know, aren't really part of you, but, no. um, all, all yeah. self-made, all self-constructed crap. Yeah. Self-constructed. Yeah. Just the, the chatter. And Monkey brain. Remember, 
the monkey I, brain. I remember sitting at my computer and I was literally thinking about like, what is my life going to look like? And they, uh, I got a call as like a, a number I didn't from a state I didn't recognize. So I thought it was like spam, uh, uh, you know, spam call. And I was like, why didn't my phone tell me it was spam? You know, so I just kind of like answered it in a bad mood. I was like, hello, <laughs> no, it was going to be an automated voice. It was going to be a car. Uh, can I talk to you about your car extended car warranty? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hello. And there was like a silence. And he's like, hi, this is Charlie. And I was like, okay. And then he was like. Yeah, Charlie from Sundance. And I thought he was calling just to say it didn't make it. They don't do because that. I just, they don't yeah, do I just, I wasn't, it was, you know, it's like way of the samurai logic, expect nothing, prepare for everything, which sure. is probably bad logic. So I was just kind of bracing myself for the look, you know, we're just, you know, we're a limited year. We're not accepting as many movies, blah, blah, blah. And he, he, it was the total opposite. He was like, we loved it. It was, you're amazing. And da, 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 da. Um, which, you know, is nice to hear sometimes. Sure. <laughs> and then, yeah. And then he, he told me, and I just remember feeling like I floated out of my body and floated around the house for a minute. So. <laughs> That oh, must cool. have been amazing. And of course, unfortunately, this list this year's Sundance was not in person. So you didn't yeah. get the full Sundance experience. No. Not this year. I've been to Sundance multiple times. Uh, it, it's so great. I love Sundance. Yeah, I had the, the bags ready to fill up. Yeah, from the from the, <laughs> from the, the gifting suites. Oh, God. Yeah, the gifting suites and all. Oh, yeah, all that stuff. But uh, that's uh, it, if it's just a very special Sundance is a very special park city is a very special place. Yes. Yeah. No question. Now, when is this, uh, when is the film coming out and when is it available? Uh, this Friday. It comes out this Friday, which would be March 18th. 18th. And it'll be available everywhere or just in theaters In theaters. And then two weeks later on demand streaming, yeah. streaming everywhere, anywhere you can get streaming rentals and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. And what's next for you? Ooh. Um, you know, as a, as a master of my own destiny, there are two things. So next would probably most likely be, um, actually a TV series. And I have a film as well called 1968, but on the TV side, it is the rise and fall of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance kid. That sounds nice. Is, yeah. That's, so I'm really super excited fun. and it's again, bending the genre and looking at it from a different perspective, from the point of view of a Pinkerton agent that has to get into the gang in order to sabotage them. But oh. he ends up feeling closer to the gang than actually the Pinkertons, so, which is a true story as well. Really? I mean, if you're hanging out with Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, I mean, you're going to, I'm assuming that's a pretty cool hangout. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So I have a couple questions to ask all my guests. Uh, mm -hmm. What advice would you give a filmmaker or screenwriter trying to break into the business today? Follow your heart. Tell a story that isn't dependent on the outcome, but something that feels cathartic and true to you. And um, if you just want to be a director and not a screenwriter, I would say write a screenplay because that will help develop your vision and a sense for the kinds of stories you want to tell, regardless if you even want to do something with that screenplay. So what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Trust the process, have patience, trust in the universe. Enjoy the flow. Just get into the flow. Yes. Don't get out and push the river. The river flows by itself. Yes. <laughs> The rings. Now, uh, I'm going to ask you a two-part question. Um, three of your favorite films of all time. As of, oh right, as of right now, at this moment in time, it could obviously change in a matter of 15 minutes. But at this oh recording, three films. Uh, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid by Sam <sighs> Peckinpah. That's good. Um, ooh, Jesus Christ. Uh... See, then, then I, I, I blank out. Uh, I'll do some contemporaries okay. because they're alive. Get their roses. Uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, There Will Be Blood. Sure. Um, and then I would say 
seven samurai characters. Well, I mean, of course, I mean, seven samurai. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, there are so many, but there's thousands, there's thousands, of I'm, course. I'm blank. And then three screenplays every screenwriter should read. Ooh, um, I would say Goodfellas. Good one. I would say any Woody Allen. Maybe I shouldn't. He's listen, listen. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Andy Hall is still one of the greatest romantic comedies of all time. Yeah, um, I would. Yeah, I would say probably an Andy, probably a Woody, any Woody Allen script. Um, and then I would say Kill Bill, Volume One. Volume One. Yes, mm -hmm. I consider both of them one movie. I, the the whole bloody affair. They are one movie, and the script. I when I said Volume One. The script is actually one long script <laughs> that he cut up into two. I think they cut. I think yeah. he wanted to do one originally, right? Just one long movie, yeah. right? Yeah. It was the studio that's like, no, 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 we're going to split this up and make more money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> is he ever going to do three? Is that ever going to happen? Do you know? Come I don't on. No, he he plays around. Like there can be moments where he'll because he loves to read what he's writing to his friends. Yeah. So there are moments where you'll where we'll be like hanging out and he's like, hey, you want to read this thing, the next thing I'm doing? And it's like another Western. And then you're like, oh, that's cool. Okay. And then like three months later, he's like, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. And so you never know. So you've listened yeah. to like pitches and scripts of his that will oh, never. Yeah. He, he read one about a uh, post-Civil War Western that tied in like Django and all of them. So. Oh, a part of the, the QT universe, of course. Yeah. 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 I have to ask you one question. Maybe you'll know. Is he serious with this whole 10 movie thing or 11 movie thing that he's like, he's going to retire? He can't, he can't retire. I think so. And I'll say why, because his, his life has changed so much. He's with his family. Now. Sure. Sure. He, he's with a kid. A yeah. Child. Yeah. So he's a father, Quentin. So it's a different artist. You know, you can never stay this. this no, of course. Man. Yeah, so yeah. I think he I think he will be equally as happy as a uh, as a writer, as a movie writer. As just a, like a, novelist. a novelist like that. I think Once Upon a Time yeah. in Hollywood was his first kind of. Yeah. And he has a podcast that he loves that fulfills him. Got it. So, um, Kristen, thank you so much uh, for being thank on the show. You. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure talking to you. Uh, you're always welcome back. I can't wait to see your career flourish and see what you come up with <laughs> next. I'm really interested. But thank you again so much for coming on the show and continued success. Thank you so much. Have a good day. I want to thank Kristen so much for coming on the show and dropping her knowledge bombs on the tribe today. Thank you so much, Kristen. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, including how to watch her remarkable film, Alice, head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash 185. And if you haven't already, please head over to screenwritingpodcast.com, subscribe, and leave a good review for the show. It truly helps us out a lot. And on a side note, guys, I just want to thank you all for listening and sharing this information that we have at Bulletproof Screenwriting because it has become one of, if not the biggest, screenwriting podcast on Apple and Spotify. I've been seeing the numbers, and it is so humbling that the show has grown so much over the last couple of years. It has grown faster than I ever expected it to. So humbly from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for all the support. Please continue to share this information. I want to help as many screenwriters and filmmakers out there as humanly possible. Thank you again so much for listening, guys. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at BulletproofScreenwriting.tv. 